Hello, um, uh, my name is Matthew Farber, and a uh, short introduction. I was a former classroom teacher, social studies teacher for nine years. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Northern Colorado in the School of Teacher Education, and I've authored um, some books on how teachers use games in the classroom, um, specifically how they adapt games and how they uh, take parts of games and how they use game-based learning in the classroom. Um, and uh, at the end of last year, uh, Karen and I co-authored a paper for UNESCO MGIEP, which is uh, the Mahatma Gandhi, I always forget the whole, whole name, Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. They've been quite supportive of using games for learning and games for uh, social emotional learning, specifically. Hi, how are you? Uh, I am Dr. Karen Schreier. I am also uh, the co-author of the awesome UNESCO Working Paper, completely free, online, available for everyone. Uh, this is my 13th Games for Change. I'm so excited to be here. I love this conference. It's my favorite conference of all time, so I'm so happy to be here. Um, just a few things. So I am the director of Games and Emerging Media at Marist College. Uh, this is my eighth year there. And I teach games, um, games and ethics. Uh, I've been researching perspective taking and empathy for the last 15 years, starting with a game that I made at MIT called Reliving the Revolution, where uh, students took on different roles from history, uh, trying to solve a history mystery of who fired the first shot at the Battle of Lexington. And uh, the, the game actually took place in the real world. So it was actually taking place using a Palm Pilot before iPhones um, and was taking place in Lexington, Massachusetts. And that interest in perspective taking has continued uh, with uh, work that I've done with Fable, uh, with Way, and Mission US, amazing series. Uh, and I've just been really driven by questions like, how do we make games, play games, uh, think about um, gaming to connect us, to help us feel more compassionate about each other, and to consider how we understand others. And I just want to leave you um, in my beginning with a story that, a, a few, uh, two stories that really kind of sunk this in for me of why this is important. Um, the first is that when I did my work with Fable, uh, one of my participants was in the middle of adopting a child. And in the game, he just had to also adopt a child. And he was able to really reflect and feel more connected to his identity as a, a, a new parent um, through adopting in this game. Um, and then with That Dragon Cancer, uh, a game that I teach with my students, uh, one of my colleagues asked me, well, how can you play that game? You lost a son. Like, how can you handle playing that? And I'm like, I want to play it and connect with others about that because I lost a son, because even though I didn't have the exact same experience, being able to connect with my students and talk to them about the game, um, through that, I'm able to have that kind of emotional connection. Um, and I hope that we can have an awesome conversation today about that. Hi, I'm Rochelle Vallon. Um, I am the middle school guidance counselor at Quest to Learn. Uh, Quest to Learn is a school here in Chelsea, a couple of blocks west. That is six through 12, um, and it was a partnership with the Institute of Play. And we focus on incorporating game-like learning and the game design process into our classrooms. And oftentimes, there's a misconception that we are just implementing games or video games, and students are somehow magically learning math, science, and empathy, et cetera. And that's not necessarily the case. And I think we'll talk a little bit later about kind of debunking those myths. But as a guidance counselor, obviously, empathy is super important for me. And what attracted me to Quest to Learn was here is this institution in this school that's actually focusing on 
supporting students holistically, but using something that we know is a huge motivator for students and for young people, and something that's not gonna go away, which is technology and games. And using those support systems to really have them understand and apply empathy in, in, in an innate way and in a way that is not through just direct teaching. As a guidance counselor, I feel like often you may sit with students and young people and they can talk to you about what it means to be empathetic, what it means to support others, but in the moment, if they're experiencing a crisis or going through difficult issues, they may, always, they may forget about that and they may not be able to show empathy in that moment. And I think games are a great way for them to be able to kind of practice that empathy and use it in kind of a practical, um, active way. Um, so that's about it. I've also done a lot of work with Institute of Play and with Arana in supporting teachers across um, different states and also mentoring teachers at Quest to Learn on how to incorporate games and the design process. And we'll I'll talk about a little bit about that later also. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jackson. I'm an assistant principal at Mapleton Expeditionary School of the Arts in Denver, Colorado. And I like board games. And I got an email from Facing History that said, do you have an idea for teaching empathy to uh, kids? And I thought, yeah. So I made a game called Empathy Builders. <laughs> it's about building empathy. It's a subtle name. So um, go to the next slide. Basically, it's a little tabletop game. You got a bunch of blocks, and you build a tower, but you build it silently. It's cooperative, and I've got a card that says blue blocks can't touch each other, and she has a card that says orange blocks can't touch the table, and he has a card that says red blocks, a red block has to be on the top, and as we're building the tower, I'll put something down, and then she takes it off, and then he puts something on top of mine, it doesn't fit my rule, and at the beginning of the game, I'm mad because people aren't doing what's important to me. Partway through the game, then we start switching cards, and in that mechanic, we empathize, and I realize, oh my gosh, you're not being a jerk, you just had a different need than I had. And in fact, those needs aren't incompatible. I just didn't know it yet. And once I know it, we actually can work together to do something. So that was a really um, big realization for me to kind of change the, the win condition. When we talk about empathy, I was an English teacher for years. And we just talked about persuasion and convincing and evidence and backing that up. You need to bring people to your side. Um, the game just kind of switches that and says, well, instead, let's just make the win condition you win once you understand other people. So um, with the grant from Facing History, uh, I built another kind of module to it where instead of building a tower, uh, you've got a scenario that you're all looking at, perhaps uh, minimum wage. And so uh, you each get a roll card, and mine says I'm a small business owner, and you're a single parent, and you're an executive of a large company, and we each need to make statements saying, well, I think this is what we ought to do. Now, I don't get points, again, for convincing us to, this is what we should do with minimum wage, raise it, lower it, keep it the same, whatever. Um, I get points if I can guess what the other roles of the people are. So for me, really practically sitting down with kids, um, much like Rochelle was talking about, um, and that conflict that they're having when they're upset with one another, sometimes it's about playing this game and saying, do you know what's on that other person's card? Once you do, I think we can work together. And so that's, a, that's why I've started to talk about empathy in, in my scenario, and that's what I hope I can share with you today. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Bronfeld. I'm the Senior Program Associate for Special Projects at Facing History and Ourselves. Um, generally, I talk to teachers and ask how many people know what Facing History and Ourselves is. Um, I took off my glasses specifically so I can't see facial expressions, whether or not you know what Facing <laughs> History and Ourselves is. Um, so really quickly, <coughs> excuse me, for the, the non-educators in the room, Facing History and Ourselves is an international educational nonprofit. We've been around since 1976. We work with primarily middle school and high school teachers, roughly 70,000 teachers a year, roughly 7 million students a year. Um, and our entire uh, goal is um, helping students change the world, a uh, small task. And the goal, the way we do that is by helping using case studies of history and literature uh, to teach students about human behavior and decision making. The, the tagline of Facing History is people make choices and choices make history. Um, and we do professional development with teachers of thinking about what do classrooms need to look like so that students can wrestle with big ideas, disagree with each other like Jackson was talking about. That um, if your only method of teaching is lecture and debate, you don't necessarily impart on students the skills to be able to function in a society where there are difficult conversations to be had. Um, 
And similarly, uh, because of the work that we're trying to do and the case studies we use, we use case studies like reconstruction in the United States. Why study reconstruction in the United States as opposed to spending eight months on the Civil War? Well, if you want students to understand democracy, difficult decision making, uh, balancing of people's needs, the war, although important, doesn't actually get you to any of those conversations. L understanding reconstruction and having to put together, weighing people's needs, weighing people's priorities, is how you get students to start thinking about these things. So why did I just spend three quarters of my three minutes telling you about facing history in ourselves? Um, you may have noticed that in November of 2016, there was an election, and <laughs> perhaps, um, and similarly, a month after, excuse me, a week after that election, we hosted a game with Institute for the Future uh, called Face the Future, a game about the future of empathy. And the tagline of that game is, you're in a world where you can feel what other people feel. Now what? And if you, I think, uh, so here's, here's just a background of what we did. Um, in 30 hours, the game only lasted 30 hours. Uh, it was played by uh, more than 10,000 people, 7,000 of whom were students in 51 countries. And the premise, uh, if you could do it one more time. Oh, there's a thing missing. That's okay. Um, that's cool. That's fine. Um, the premise of the game, excuse me, the setup of the game, is again, uh, Institute for the Future, it was their foresight engine platform uh, that Jane McGonigal um, led the research on. And the, the premise of the game is there's a new network, a new social media network called Feel That. Essentially, it's a device that you wear that allows you to share with other people what they're feeling emotionally and physically in those contexts. And the, the way the game function is we walked participants through four scenarios, an unboxing of the Field That Network, a couple who share their emotional connection via the Field net, That Network, and then the partner realizes her partner is in a car accident and she learns that by his Field That Network emotional scan. The box that is currently missing um, is talking to survivors of an earthquake by understanding their need through the emotional attachment and what happens if you understand that to philanthropy. And then the final uh, context, again, all of this is set in 2026, is what happens if people in a protest are wearing a Feel That Network? What does that do to testimony? What does that do to questions of justice, if there's police violence, et cetera, what happens when our emotions are used to, to measure um, evidence. The game then, and then I'll pass it back on, was not what would you do if you had that. Um, Facing History believes very strongly that asking students what would you have done 100 years ago, 20 years ago is mostly unrealistic. Um, the question is what could be possible with this kind of technology? What are the limits of understanding, being able to tap into other people's emotions and share um, emotions with each other? Who would you share it with? What are the dangers of that? What are the questions of privacy? All around getting students to think about what do we do in a world where we can connect better with our, our um, each other. And as I said, a week after the 2016 election, uh, 10,000 people had a lot of interesting things to say about how we engage with understanding the other. Um, before we dive into letting these guys talk to each other with some guiding questions, I am like remiss in my facilitation skills because I was supposed to um, find out who is in our audience and I do want to do it um, just so they know who they're talking to. So I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand if I say something that describes your role. Um, so if you are a teacher, raise your hand. Teacher, okay, thank you. All right. If you're a developer, thank you. A researcher. Awesome. Media specialist, librarian, kind of, all right. Um, and it's people who work with teachers, PD facilitators, PD organizations, awesome. Okay, thank you. All right, sorry about that. Huh? Whoa, somebody raised their hand four times. All right, okay, all right, so, so, <laughs> yeah, sometimes you do have to do it all, I understand. Okay. So we're going to start with some questions just to frame the discussion a little bit. The first one that we're going to start with is for you guys, the panel, to explain to us a little bit about transportation theory and how it relates to empathy. Well, um, transportation theory, is anybody familiar with transportation theory is? You are? Okay. Well, some of the research actually comes from Parsons. Um, and uh, transportation theory has to do with your mental transport into fictional worlds. Um, 
so it's part and parcel a bit with uh, suspension of disbelief, but also being you know like a really good book where you're engrossed in a story. Um, if it was a game, we call it addicted, but. In a book or other film, you know, you're completely like binge watching, and you're having connections with those characters. Uh, and uh, in the paper that uh, Karen and I wrote, we explored where transportation theory works in games uh, and what games have to offer in that. It's particularly narrative games um, because narrative games hit on specific emotions. Uh, when you watch TV or film, you have this. Uh, what what um, Catherine Spister, a professor from UC Santa Cruz refers to as a parasocial connection with a character. So, you know, you watch a TV show week after week, you're having this parasocial connection of whether that character, no, don't, do, don't go there, don't go into that dark alley, right? But you don't feel how that person feels going to that dark alley because transportation theory needs to be married to agency. And that's where games offer something quite specific. Uh, and because you are controlling the experience, um, you have, agency, right? So um, you can feel certain emotions in games like guilt or complicity. For example, Edith Finch, which won an award yesterday, right? Um, you feel guilt and complicity in that. You wouldn't feel that from watching a film. So that is one of the unique affordances in games that can then, guilt in some research, uh, can lead to, possibly, to skills such as empathy. Yeah, um, also, I'm, I'm really interested not only in the playing of games, but the process of making games. Can we get so immersed in that process that we start to uh, kind of co-design with other people, empathize with other perspectives as we're trying to build a game? I'm working with the AEDL this year as a Belfer Fellow, and I'm so excited to be um, working with the Global Game Jam as well, we're going to be doing some research on uh, the process of making games through a game jam, um, how we can support perspective taking, human understanding, and uh, just really being able to kind of understand our own identity and other people even in our design collaboration, um, understand their identities as we make games for uh, empathy and for um, bias reduction. Uh, and you know, it's a really great question. It's, a, it's an open question that I hope others here will also chime in on their own research in this area. And as, as far as transportation theory, stacking blocks and, and, and passing cards, mind, it, it isn't a separate world, but it was really intentional as, as we designed the game to think about the core mechanic that what we're actually doing in the game and passing those cards was related to empathy. So that was the, the thought that we had. What you're actually doing in the game, you know, what is it when you do empathy? You're kind of looking in at what somebody else did. And, and passing the cards, it's subtle. It's really simple. Um, but it's been a pretty powerful way for really even young kids in middle school to say, oh, now I get what you're saying. Um, so that's kind of how I see it even in a really simple way. I think also um, it's important building that connection and allowing students to connect from a developmental standpoint. I think a lot of middle schoolers don't always find the value in something or the importance in something if they can't connect to it. Um, so I think at Quest, the main way that we incorporate game like learning is through this mission or through this narrative. So if students are learning about, you know, um, work and force or, you know, other science skills, it's not just turn to this page and, and creating this environment where they feel disconnected. It's allowing them to take on those roles. So they're not just learning math, they're becoming mathematicians. And by immersing them in that and giving them that role, they can empathize with that specific position and it connects them and makes them feel like, okay, I wanna learn this information because I can understand this perspective and it's not just kind of this foreign topic or things that happened 100 years ago that I can't relate to. And just real quick, um, going back to the block, so some games are not narrative driven, right? There are games that are at, that abstract, right? Uh, Mary Flanagan has lots of games like that out of Tilt Factor, um, like um, Layoff, for example, or Pox. Um, so, but, and as we assign meaning to those things, right, that's where empathy can come in. Uh, what we should also mention is that empathy, like games, preaching to the choir here, is very nuanced. 
It's not like, you know, games. It's not a game, right? It's, you know, there's many different types of games. There's also many different types of empathy. So we've got historical empathy, reactive empathy, cultural empathy. Um, yeah, I think there's like, there's like 10 different kinds of empathy. It's like parallel empathy, effective empathy, yeah. react, like, reactive. like as many people as there are in this room, there are probably as many definitions of empathy also. So part of it is like just trying to figure out like what is empathy? And then the question is, could we even use games to help us understand what empathy is, right? I mean, could we actually understand ourselves better through just the process of playing or the process of making games or the process of talking about games? Uh, you know, we really don't know what empathy even is, and it's hard to even set the limits and the boundaries on that. Uh, you know, it's almost like we first have to figure out what it is. Uh, and then be able to try to understand, well, well, how do we support that through gaming? So another part of the transportation theory and in terms of variety of empathy is the question that I would hope people ask themselves of empathy to what end? Why are we trying to get people to feel empathy? Why are we trying to get students to feel empathy? And if the answer is so that they do something, if, if it's not an awareness outcome but an action outcome, it's really important that we think about, well, what kind of empathy gets you to action? Um, I think in a lot of the work that we do in the classroom, there's the shock and awe approach to education. Maybe if I scare the living daylights out of my kids enough, they'll be so scared that their behavior will change. And I think um, personal experience, uh, my 10th grade history teacher started every day for a week showing Schindler's List in the morning. Um, no joke, right? Every day for a week. And that was the entirety of the unit. Maybe if we scare the crap out of kids, they <laughs> won't let it happen again, right? And there's a, there's a real um, sense of maybe we can get kids to feel enough in, in transport them enough that they will magically then apply that to their own context that look nothing like the game, but they'll magically be able to apply it and know what decisions to make. And that's a really big jump that we're expecting people to make, especially if you're working with kids who are teenagers. So, so there's an element of that the transportation theory has that it can take you to a point. I might be able to feel what, uh, or have a sense of feeling what these people are feeling, but if your goal is to then do something, then that's not necessarily enough, or I would even argue responsible if you're getting kids just to feel terror um, and then turning them out into the streets. So that was actually a perfect lead into my you're next welcome. question. Thank you. Um, the next question is around misconceptions um, and being immersed in an experience. So what are some of those misconceptions that people have about what games are going to be able to do as immersive spaces? Well, um, I always go back to Seymour Papert and the children's machine. So, you know, we've got the teaching machines that have been uh, going on since um, Skinner boxes, you know, like rats and mazes and like reward systems, right? And then we still see iterations of this with educational technology. But uh, Seymour Papert, if you're not familiar with Seymour Papert, argued that children should be not learning from the computer, but the computer should be learning from the child. Uh, so that's why one of the reasons we put Empathy Machine in our uh, working paper um, has to do with that, as well as other references that have come up uh, regarding virtual reality, where you put on a virtual reality headset, and suddenly you are transported and you are that person. Uh, but it's way more nuanced than that, uh, particularly uh, the definition of empathy, the simple definition of empathy, feeling how someone else feels. Um, you know, a lot of literature really leans more towards you would have more empathy for non-playable characters uh, that go with you on this you know, uh, hero's journey or makes a sacrifice for you. I think just adding on to what you were saying before, I think the biggest misconception is that you know, games are kind of like the end all be all and that you know, if you're introducing games into the classroom, that it kind of takes the place of, you know, the teaching or traditional lessons. And often when we have people come in into our school, we'll say, you might not see what you think you're going to see. You may go into the classroom and see a very traditional lesson happening. And it's really understanding, and, and as I've mentored teachers and helped them incorporate games into the classroom, you know, the question is, what are you trying to, what is the end goal? And what is it that you're trying to have 
have kids understand. And maybe that's a game, maybe it's an electronic game, maybe it's a board game, maybe it's a game like activity or even a design. And understanding that there isn't going to be this one perfect game that totally solves everything or totally teaches everything. And when you're talking about empathy, maybe there are a couple of games here and there where it's the sole purpose is to teach empathy, but oftentimes it's using a game or game-like experience where the things that are happening, the process, is what is teaching empathy, not necessarily the game itself. Or even in the design process, which we like to do a lot at Quest, it's as you're going through this design process, you are empathizing. You need to understand what the user needs or what the user needs to get out of that experience. Maybe the conversations you're having after that game and the questions you're asking is what's fostering that empathy and not the game itself. Yeah, I mean, I. I love what you just said because it's exactly what I was thinking. It was like you took the words right out of my mouth. Um, it's not the end all be all, right? I mean, it really isn't. It's, um, you know, everybody comes to a play experience with their own experiences, with their own biases, with their own um, assumptions and expectations. And we also can't expect that we're going to just provide them with this one solution. It's a teacher, it's a con there's a context, it's a complex system that they're entering into and there's gonna be complex results. You know, and I, you know, a lot of times we kind of see this kind of dichotomy. It's either like people are like, this is the best thing ever, games are gonna solve everything, or it's the worst thing ever and we're gonna be addicted and like, no. Nah. So, um, you know, to me, I like to embrace <laughs> this idea that it's like, there's like the green grass possibilities, but there's also like the brambles and the weeds and the thorns, and we kind of have to accept that all of that is part of it. It's a complex system where we are we are complex people, and we're entering into those complexities to like embrace the complexity of it. So if, if you could go back uh, to that. Um, so I, I said before, um, in terms of how our game was set up, that the, the intro videos were only, um, I think, total nine minutes out of the 30 hours that the game was available. Um, you could watch the video as many times as you wanted, but the video itself was not the game. The video itself was the impetus for the game. And what the game was, was entirely a series of conversations. It was, it was um, live conversation cards. Excuse me, the only way you received points, you received almost no points for playing a card, you got many points if other people responded to your card, right? The, the whole function was increasing empathy <laughs> through action. And what the, the reason I, I want to bring this up in terms of misconceptions is that we picked four scenarios. I mentioned them earlier, four scenarios for that nine minute video. But over the course of the hours, and I need to look up the exact number, there were 64,000 cards played, different ideas played into this game. And that where the participants took it were all over the place. They were concerned about what does this do, what could we use empathy for? What, how can empathy be used against us in ways that we could never have predicted and also couldn't have fit into a nine minute video? So part of this is also thinking about how are you creating, op how are we creating worlds where we give people the impetus and the, the um, inspiration to then go apply, develop and apply the empathy versus feeling the need to create the entirety of the world all, all self-bound already before as the game started. And uh, a quick anecdote. I uh, recently co-authored some uh, curriculum around Edith Finch. And um, actually the process of doing that was really inspiring because the game is, it, it brings about a lot of empathy for the characters in the game uh, because games do something unique in that because you take those actions, or sometimes those actions are limited, as we'll get to shortly, um, you feel something. Games can really uh, bring about or evoke emotions that other media can't <laughs> always do. Uh, and I really wanted to talk about my game experience with uh, somebody else. So writing the curriculum was great because it was almost like a book club chat. Uh, you had that conversation to discuss with somebody, and that's really important, especially when you talk about um, games that are facilitated by teachers. Um, you know, it's not just like a finished product that pops up in the app store and it's going to suddenly make people empathetic. Uh, you need to have a lot of curriculum around it, a lot of conversations. Uh, you can't just, you know, you have seven badges you, you've unlocked, so you're more empathetic. You know, it's a lot more open-ended than that. And those reflections and debriefs and discussions, uh, more than that, they also hit on your executive function in your brain. 
which uh, really helps to deepen and extend that experience. And again, empathy is a skill. That's another misconception. Um, it's not just an emotion. You know, we're not like filled with villains like in television and film, uh, filled with you know sociopathic people all over the place. Uh, a, a large majority, or almost everybody, has that capacity for empathy. But it's a skill, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I really like what you said about connecting people. Like, you were connecting through a game with someone else and being able to kind of have this, like, book club experience. And I think those are the kinds of experiences we could build in games or even around games um, to really support that kind of human connection. For example, when I was researching Way, which is this amazing little game um, that is so powerful and so meaningful, um, it was made, um, I think, by students at the Entertainment um, Technology <coughs> Center in uh, Carnegie Mellon. And uh, uh, what it is is you play with someone and you don't know who they are. It's completely anonymous, it's online, and you're playing with them and you have to kind of gesture to them and kind of let them know how to kind of get through the level. And you can, you have to rely on them. You have to, you're kind of responsible to them to give directions and also to interpret their uh, directions. You can't talk though. You can't connect in a verbal way and you have no idea where they're from or who they are. Um, you can only use the, your avatar to gesture and you know, that's it. And by the end of the game, it's only like a 20 to 30 minute game, but by the end, the two people are like friends for life. Like they're, the only time they get to really connect, like talk to each other is through this like little whiteboard that they can kind of draw to each other. And uh, ev almost every single time I played this, they're at the end, they're like, we're friends now. Like we, you know, we're, you know, they want to know where they're from. They want to understand each other. They want to share with each other. Um, just through the connecting experience of playing together and having a, a mission or a goal that is uh, collaborative and connecting. Before we get to questions, one thing uh, that we uncovered in our paper was uh, where agency sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work, where it's like withheld or um, may not work that well. So what we have up here is this game called Spent, which um, Who's familiar with this game? Okay. So uh, Spent won, uh, maybe it won, or it was nominated at least for an award at Games for Change. And uh, we looked at some research from Yale, from Gina Russos, and um, <coughs> as it turned out, this game, um, if, if you have a, this belief in a, um, if you, meritocracy, let's say, right, the b is the belief that anybody can pull themselves up from the bootstraps with no, um, no other outside influencers, right? So people who had a low belief in that, they believe that you know uh, there's a lot more complexities to it, um, actually felt less empathetic to poor people after playing this game. Uh, because as it turned out, the game was presenting two bad choices, as uh, Sandy Chen um, referred to as force failure, um, which we quote in there. The uh, idea that um, you're given these two bad choices, so people are playing the game, we're starting to think that poor people are poor because they're making bad choices. Uh, but um, as uh, Karen's written or done in her class also, you want to speak to that? Like fix it in here? Or? Oh, yeah. So I w we were just talking before that um, one thing that we do in our classes is we have the students play spent, and then we ask them, well, how would you redesign it to make it more reflective of what it means to be financially insecure or what it, you know, how you would express your own uh, experiences through it better. And that's actually worked really well um, as a learning experience because I think that even if a game isn't perfect and like what game is, like what person is, what anything is, um, we can learn from it, we can grow from it and we can um, use it to uh, help us understand ourselves and our world better. And then the next one is that dragon cancer. So in this particular uh, vignette, um, agency is intentionally uh, withheld, I guess, right? Um, well, it depends on your perspective, right? So whatever you do in this particular vignette, uh, if you give um, the, uh, the crying, I'm just assuming everybody knows the story of That Dragon Cancer. <laughs> but in That Dragon Cancer, in this scene, um, you're in the hospital, and you're trying to console your child who is crying all night. And if you give a juice box or if you pick up the child, nothing works. 
because nothing works. And you know, in life, uh, oftentimes we don't have agency. We don't have control over things. So, and there are cases where a game can effectively remove agency to deliver an empathetic message. And just to add on to that, and again, speaking to teachers in the room, I think there's a really strong desire amongst especially progressive, innovative teachers to ask that question of, I mentioned this at the beginning, what would you have done, past tense? Um, and I think this is a, a powerful example um, where what Matt just said, there's a difference between asking students, what would you have done if you were the parent in this scenario, where there's a good chance most of the students have never been in this situation, so they don't really have any idea what they would have done, they're guessing, versus getting to the point where they realize that they're in a situation with no agency, and asking students, can you now think of a time when you had no agency? What, how did you operate in that context? Taking it out of the thing they practiced in, the sandbox of empathy, which is the game, and asking them to apply it to their own context. Um, I had a student once ask me at a presentation, if an escaped slave asked you for help, would you help them? And I, I said, well, I would hope so, but you're asking me about something 150 years ago, and I live in New York City, and I walk past people on the street asking me for help every single day. So why are you asking me what I would have done 150 years ago and not ask me what I did yesterday or what I would do tomorrow? And how do we get students to take that sandbox of empathy from the game or the context or whatever and to think of the universal questions that it's trying to ask and ask them to apply it to a context that they are intimately familiar with as a way of practicing that skill and that muscle of empathy? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.